we? <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Reef Environmental Education Foundation here in Key Largo, Florida. My name is Jill Keenert, and I'm the director of the Key Largo campus here. Um, you are in a building next to one of the oldest buildings in the Upper Keys and just south of one of the newest buildings in the Florida Keys, which is a brand new ocean exploration center that we're building here, all in furtherance of our mission to educate and engage people in marine conservation here in the Florida Keys. So um, can I just get a show of hands, like who's brand new here? Who's never been in this room before? Wow, oh my gosh. That's, that's amazing, I love that. Thank you so much. So this room, you'll see the mural around the side of it. Take a time to, um, after we're done, look around at it. It's a one of a kind kind of photo mural of all the different kind of um, uh, marine ecosystems we have here in the Florida Keys from the, the Bayside mangrove area through the shallow and patch reefs and around to the deep wrecks. One of the things that we do here at Reef is to help um, educate people about all the different kind of fish species that we have here in the Keys and in elsewhere so that we can track endangered species and protect against invasive species. And um, we call this series Fish and Friends. So every month we have a speaker come in, usually someone from the local marine conservation uh, community. Today we're really delighted to have Dr. Jason Spadero with us from um, Moat Marine Laboratory. He's part of their coral reef restoration uh, research project here. And I thought it would be great to hear how the corals are doing because we've all been in this hot water last summer and eager to hear how they're doing. And I hope Jason will talk a little bit about that because coral are friends of fish, but it turns out crabs are friends of fish also. So our fish and friends tonight will be very broad species wise. And just a second, um, Jason will talk to us about restoring coral reef ecosystems with Caribbean king crab, and that's, thanks. so it's going to be great. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Before we get started, just a few uh, announcements from us about upcoming programs. Um, we have one called Strange Fishes of the Pacific Northwest. So we uh, empower divers and snorkelers around the world to identify fish in their area. This Fishinar, which is an online presentation, will happen um, on March 19th, and it'll be focused on the Pacific Northwest fishes. So I personally have not dive, dove in the Pacific Northwest, but I guess they have some strange fishes there. And it's always a good time. You learn if you're a diver and you can't get wet often enough, you know, try one of these fishinars and um, learn about uh, the different areas. Community events, if you're around and about in the community, you'll see our amazing staff and interns. Um, putting tables up at community events to teach people about marine conservation. On March 16th, which is the Saturday, we'll be at the I Irish Fest at the Caribbean Club. And um, later, we'll be at the Island Fest in Isla Mirada. Do I have, are any of the interns in here at the moment? They're cleaning up, bless their hearts. <laughs> so we're really glad to have them. Um, I think at the end, I'll make sure they raise their hands and we can all see who they are. So can I have the next slide, please? Just one more event that I wanted to tell you about. Um, we're gonna have a paint and sip, um, an ocean-themed paint and sip with local artist Cassandra Clark of Jellyfish Daydreams. Uh, Cassandra's special area of art is tattooing. We're not gonna do a self-tattoo. It's not gonna be paint and tattoo. It's paint and sip. This is the picture that she's gonna be doing with us. We're gonna do it right here in this room and proceeds from that will go to benefit um, Reef and our programs. And I, I'm looking forward to drawing a stingray. Like I never, how do you draw that? How do you paint that? So Cassandra will be here with us and you can sign up for these and all of our programs on reef.org. So the next one. Um, I also wanna say thank you to our volunteers in addition to our interns. Our volunteers make this possible, especially Nancy. There's Nancy back there, yay, thank you. And Laura and Fred are right up here in the front too. Thank you. So our members really help make this possible that we can, are able to put this on, event on at no charge um, for the community. Are there any other community announcements for marine science, community conservation related? Lisa from the... Yep. Stand up. 
<laughs> Hi, Lisa. Lisa from the History of Diving Museum, in case any of you don't know me. But we currently have a Dive Into Art Corals Creation art exhibit, which features moat and coral practitioners. So it's a good time to stop by the museum. And then we have an event on May 29th that's a Dive Into Art and Music, divingmuseum.org. Check it out. Awesome. Thank you. Very cool. All right. One more slide. Um, so we want to thank um, these these presentations in this program of Fish and Friends um, is funded in part with grant agreements from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, Florida Coastal Management Program, and Office for Coastal Management. This, you know, this is uh, funding that helps uh, nonprofits like us make sure that both residents and visitors to the Keys alike be equipped and educated about the importance of our marine environment. So we're very thankful for that support. And the next slide, I think, is going to be back to Jason's title slide. And finally, we're good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Oh, thank you. I'm, okay. Is the mic on? Are we good? <clears throat> well, so I'm, I'm Dr. Jason Spadaro. I'm the uh, program manager for coral reef restoration research at Moat Marine Laboratory. So I, I'm responsible for... Um, kind of supervising all of our coral reef restoration and research activities and here in the Florida Keys and at one new facility up in Sarasota that we'll talk about a little later. Uh, and I'll admit, I just finished these slides <laughs> right before I left to come up here. So I, I forgot that I'd given a title. So there's another, you know, different title here. Uh, but they all talk about the same thing. We're going to talk about the most important species on the face of the planet in the history of life on earth, which is the one that I study. Um, <clears throat> but first, um, thank you. Thank you so much for the, for the delightful int introduction. And, and um, coral reefs are, are really one of the most biologically and ecologically diverse ecosystems on the planet. Lots of people call them the rainforests of the sea, and that's BS. They, you know, rainforests are the coral reefs of the land, right? You know, so, so, Literally, you know, in, in almost every metric on healthy coral reefs, they, they outpace every other ecosystem on the planet. Biodiversity, species richness, uh, 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 biological production, all of these different things. Um, but it's interesting that if you took every piece of living coral reef habitat on the planet today and stuffed it all into one space, it would fit inside Colorado. That is the entire spatial extent of living coral reef habitat on Earth. So it's interesting that even though you've got this tiny little bit of the, of the seafloor, really of the, of the surface of the planet, ho houses somewhere between 25 and 33 percent of all species that occur in our seas. So you can uh, kind of that kind of helped at least when I was a, when I was a, an educator that helped the students kind of put that into context. There are that many species and, and many individuals within each of those species crammed into this tiny little space. Um, and if we care about breathing uh, air, which I, I mean, I do, you know, um, and we don't want that to become a rare commodity. I don't know if anybody remembers space balls. Um, then we should probably care about the health of our, of our coral reefs as they are kind of the canaries in the coal mine for the health of our ocean ecosystems. And those ocean ecosystems, coral reefs don't produce a large proportion of the oxygen that we breathe, but our open ocean ecosystems do. And if we start seeing coral reefs decline, we know that they're kind of the hallmark of degradation across our entire ocean ecosystem. Um, so aside from that very important benefit of, of being kind of the hallmark of, of health in our ocean ecosystems, Coral reefs also are very economically important. I mean, obviously here in the Florida Keys, we're no stranger to some of the economic activities that coral reefs support. They're one of the most valuable natural resources. Uh, well, they are probably the most valuable natural resource here in Florida, but also kind of around the globe um, where recreational diving, snorkeling and, and fishing along with commercial fishing all support local economies and, and in many cases national economies um, throughout the region here in the Caribbean and Florida, but also throughout the Indo-Pacific, the Red Sea, you know, so on and so on. Um, we're also very 
very, very acutely aware. I think there might be another of another another ecological function that uh, well ecosystem service that coral reefs provide, which is mitigating a lot of this wave energy from offshore. So a healthy coral reef, um, even during say hurricanes like Hurricane Ian, where we saw massive wave energy coming in. I mean, obviously not all the wind that we would expect, or at least that Sarasota got, but a lot of a lot of wave energy coming in offshore. And and I saw it firsthand. We live on Summerland and I watched the water come up just about three feet from my back door before it stopped and receded. That's an enormous amount of energy to come in that far. A healthy coral reef ecosystem can mitigate, repackage and redirect 97% of that energy as it comes through the crest of that reef. So only 3% of that kinetic energy is actually making it through to impact our shorelines. So they are incredibly important to us in many different ways. Um, being such a, such an interesting system that's, that's impacted you know, and, and literally impacted, not affected by kinetic energy from offshore very you know, frequently. Um, it's interesting that these, these hyper complex, very biodiverse ecosystems are actually what we call disturbance mediated ecosystems. So they require periodic disturbance like wave energy, hurricanes, heat waves, things like that. Without those periodic disturbances, competition would take over and survival of the fittest would rule. So you'd have very few species out competing everybody else. By having these periodic disturbance events come through, it evens the playing field across many different species. And that's why we're able to have such high biodiversity on reefs. But if they're disturbance mediated ecosystems, why are they in trouble? Well, we're a disturbance, right? Yeah. Well, well and I'd, I'd like to think that we're also, you know, the opposite. Yeah. Many, many different things, right? Well, on top of all the normal disturbances, we tend to take, you know, and I said that coral reefs are one of the most productive ecosystems on the planet, but they're also one of the most efficient ecosystems on the planet. So for every gram of carbon that they produce, they're using about 80% of it. So there's only about 20% of that energy that you can take out of that ecosystem without starting to take wheels out of the machine, right? And if you take too many by overfishing or reducing pH on the water, or as we saw this summer, massive heat waves, things like that, or, or even, you know, just up our neighbors up here in Miami, putting uh, some suspicious looking green water into the, into the system, just a couple of meters away from our reef, you end up going from a system that's incredibly complex, very energy efficient and, and, and complex to one that's much less energy efficient, much more productive in terms of net productivity versus growth, gross. And you end up with a system like this with, with simpler critters that can handle these, these kind of degraded conditions. Typically, that manifests as algae, um, octocorals, and sponges, which all have this kind of vicious cycle that they, they reinforce one another. And that shift from a healthy, biocomplex, ecologically you know, complex uh, ecosystem to one that is, is in a different state is called a phase shift or hysteresis or, an alternative, or, or, or a shift between alternative stable states or as I loved in every, in every ecology course in grad school, um, you abbreviate alternative stable states and it's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, um, you can think of these phase shifts as, as just kind of on a continuum of coral, right? So, and, and I'm sorry, this is, this is kind of a model, but it's, it's kind of important for what we're, what we're talking about in multiple dimensions here. So if you think of this as a graph, right? On, on the vertical axis, you have coral cover. So the amount of the bottom that's covered in living coral. At the bottom, it would be low. At the top, it would be high. And then across the bottom, you have grazing intensity. So not a lot of stuff eating salad, lots of stuff eating salad. <laughs> and if you have lots of coral and lots of vegetarians on the reef, you're in this coral-dominated stable state. So we think it is a stable state, and this is a very simplified model. Um, so you'd have a healthy coral reef ecosystem. If you lose coral or vegetarians, 
you go across this black line, which is kind of a, a, an unstable equilibrium, and these white lines on either side are thresholds. If you cross a threshold, all of a sudden the ball starts rolling downhill on its own. Stuff starts reinforcing that shift in phase to coral depauperate. And that is a $30 word for unhealthy. <laughs> so no coral left, right? Uh, an ecosystem that's dominated by something other than corals. And in the 1970s, the, the reefs here in the Florida Keys were up in this, this state up here. And, and, and the people that were here in the 1970s were like, yep, that's when they were healthy. Talk to somebody that was here in the 50s and they're like, you don't know what you're talking about. So that's a shifting baseline. But this is the baseline that we're, that we're talking about. And that is the last time really that our reefs were truly healthy. Not, not that they looked healthy because that was all the way up until probably the mid, mid, early mid eighties or so. They still looked good, but they weren't. They were, they were shifting across this, this axis here. And notice that it's not, it's not the coral that went away. It's the, it's the vegetarians but you still had that coral dominant stable state. And then in 1983, which is why I put 1984, I showed up, but also <laughs> we lost diadema, which is that long spined sea urchin that we've seen in the news. Well, I see in the news a lot. And it was one of these keystone herbivores. And we'll talk a little more about why I'm, I'm doing this and, and spitting keystone out. Um, we lost them, which, which is why we shifted very strongly across that axis. And then in the early 90s and then through all the way to you know, current, the number and magnitude of marine diseases that came up on our reefs just, just skyrocketed and demolished our vertical axis here. We lost a lot of the corals. And, now, and, and really, we could basically put us in this kind of area starting in the 19 or the early 1990s now we've we've kind of like embedded ourselves right in the in the crotch there at the bottom so we have very little coral you know less than one percent or so coral cover on our reef and very very little grazing intensity not because we don't have a lot of herbivores but because we moved all the stuff that wasn't algae and filled it in with algae so i mean think about a lawnmower going around a uh a playground with lots of hardscape on it, it's very easy to mow all that grass. If you put grass over the whole thing, it's a heck of a lot more, more labor intensive, you know? Same thing is going on with our reef. As we remove coral and fill that in with algae, the same number of herbivores are acting on a much larger field. Um, so enough of the ecology lesson. Now we'll talk about restoration, right? And that is the, one of the things that Moat, I think, does very, very well. And the vast majority of, of restoration is, is talked about it's coral restoration, right? Everybody talks about the coral restoration program, this, and the coral restoration, that, and everything. And that is because, well, that was the thresholds part. Sorry. I just <laughs> finished these slides on the way up, right? You go across one of the white lines, it'll go on its own. Um, Restoration typically has focused on active restoration, actively putting corals back on the reef, not to replace them, but to put out enough of the mommy and daddy corals that they make baby corals and shift us up that vertical axis, directly affecting coral cover. That is a very long distance. This is not, right? So it's, that's why there's two axes here. Um, so how do we reverse this phase shift acting on that vertical? Well, this is out of, out of order, but that's okay. Um, we can, we can act on the vertical axis that I didn't remove one of the animations. Um, we can act on that vertical axis by directly replacing or putting out corals onto the reef, right? We're, we're affecting that vertical axis. And that's something that we do very well. Obviously, we've got two facilities up here in the upper keys that are just gorgeous. And I encourage you to go check them out. They're pumping out corals like crazy. And then we have Moats Elizabeth Moore International Center for Coral Reef Research and Restoration, or IC2R3. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it is the largest coral nursery in, or it's the largest land-based coral nursery in North America for now. Um, and it's down on Summerlin Key. Please come check it out. We've got 
an enormous amount of coral and then and then paired with those nurseries offshore we have corals on on uh on coral trees just like others typically these branching corals that we grow out there um and the idea is that we're propagating both branching corals and massive form reef building corals in large numbers to then outplant onto the reef in arrays of a single genotype. So as all of these are the same genetic individual and we're harnessing that growth and fusion um, capacity of the corals where those corals will grow, touch, recognize each other as the same genetic individual, fuse into one large colony. The size of these arrays that we put out are specifically designed so that when those corals grow and fuse, this is roughly 100 square centimeters of living tissue, which is the size at which corals become reproductive. It's not the age, it is the size, right? Because every one of these little polyps is an individual animal. So age wouldn't really matter, it's biomass. So that's why we put these corals out in arrays of this size so that within a couple of years, you get a reproductive colony and then they start producing stuff that puts us out of business, ideally. However, and, and the idea is to get to, to this kind of state with those branching corals where you get very, very high coral cover. And somebody was here in the 70s, right? Yeah, you saw this. And this is currently in Belize, right? Yeah, this, this, is, a, this is a site in Belize that had 0% coral cover 10 years ago. And they just started out planting three different this species of, of yes. Yeah, and Laughing Bird Key. It's beautiful. This is the other real big success recently. You have a question? Yeah. Go ahead. So, like, when you're doing the branching thing, yeah, with your isolated phenotypes, are you breeding those specifically? Mm -hmm. Like, are you isolating that that expression to where they're compatible to, to increase their compatibility chances? So. No, no, I know. You take that colony yep. and you break it up into fragments, yep. plant them close together, and that's that's the same genetic individual. However, yes, we're also looking at each of these different genotypes in different land-based, uh, you know, land-based and natural experiments to to literally determine what their responses to these different yeah. stresses are to to measure resilience. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Are you picking the genus? Are you picking specific corals to be tolerant of the stressful conditions? Uh, so that's that's a really really fantastic and interesting question that could yeah, be its own hour long talk. But yes and no, and and we'll get into that. We're we're yes in that we want we want corals that are thermally tolerant, right? Obviously, the summer was put it on full display. But what about the ones that are tolerant to ocean acidification or disease or the disease that we don't know about that's going to happen 50 years from now? So you, you not only want to select resilient individuals and resilient genotypes, but also genetically diverse individuals. So we want the dullards that aren't resilient to the stress right now, right? And, and so a lot of people, a lot of students used to ask um, about natural selection, right? Sort of, sort of, but natural selection is that the stress kills off the ones that aren't resilient to it. And the ones that are, are the ones that proceed to the next generation and spread those genes. But when that stress changes, the definition of resilient changes. So you want a diverse community, not a resilient. But the changes are happening so quick. And that's where restoration comes in. So asexual production like this, where we can make a lot of these very slow growing corals that a natural recruit, this coral baby batter would take <laughs> 10 years to get to this size. We can make 10 or 15 ramets this size in 10 months from one of them. So it's, it's, it's taking their biology and using it to our advantage. So every time you cut your skin, which is growing relatively slowly, that, that wound initiates a healing response. So your skin goes from growing at normal speed to 40 or 50 times faster to heal the wound. We're harnessing that in corals by cutting them into small fragments, causing them to grow tissue very fast, 
And then once they get to a certain point, they start depositing skeleton. And we're, we're using that to our advantage along with fusion of the colony. So we can take one of these fragments, make enough fragments to make a whole reproductive colony. And in six years, we've got what would have taken 100 in nature or 50 or 100 in nature. Yes. Yeah. Except the stress might change. Right. Yeah. What's that? So you're keeping the genotypes separate. Yes. What, what happens if you mix them? Will they diversify more or come up with new little coral genotypes? No, they fight. Genotypes or, no, they oh, yeah. Corals are jerks. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, what? Oh, no, they're giving me the like, you're not repeating the question. Oh, yeah. So, so what happens if we mix up the individual genets? Like, if we were to, yeah. and I'm getting way away, like, this is totally not about the important <laughs> species here. If you, if you put out these, these are all genetic clones of one another. But if we had, if we had genotype A, 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 B, yeah. these ones would fuse and this one would fight with these ones. And they're, no, no, they are jerks. They they can they can fight with one another. They get in chemical warfare. They eat each other. They'll spit their guts on their neighbor and eat them. Like corals are, you know, people people look at coral reefs. I might have a, uh, no, I don't. People look at coral reefs and they see this beautiful, peaceful community. And like, no, it's gang warfare. It is it is horrible to live on a coral reef. It it is dangerous it is you know they're insulting each other like it is really really not a great place to live if you're competing with all the other critters um but the beautiful part is that this works and we know it works because this photo was taken in i think august of 2020 and these these fragments of orbicella faviolata were outplanted in June of 2015. So in five years, we had a cluster of massive form corals fuse and spawn. And and love saying it. I was I was not at moat at the time, but my wife was. Uh, and that that light was right in front of my camera where I was trying to take photos of it. <laughs> Um, and they, but they got this beautiful photo and, and I got to see it myself and it wasn't just one colony. It was 18 different colonies that were all outplanted at the same rough, roughly the same time, five years later were spawning. Um, so coral restoration works direct manipulation of coral cover going up that vertical axis works, but not if you have this, not. I'm sorry, I'm like squatting. Here. <laughs> it doesn't work if you have, if you don't have appropriate habitat for the babies that result from this to land, metamorphose and settle and become a new coral colony. So you have to do something about that, that other axis on the graph. And that is the most important part of restoration. I mean, this, uh, uh, come on. This part gets all the gets all the attention and all and all that kind of stuff, but that's coral restoration. This is coral reef restoration, right? Well, I mean, you have to pair it with that part too. But yeah, I think it's great too. Like this is the part that's more interesting to me because one, this is a long distance. This is very hard. Think of it as think of it as a hill and you're pushing a bowling ball up a hill. It takes a lot of energy to get it up that way. But if you go around the side, that's a heck of a lot easier. That's a terrible analogy. But <laughs> anyway, you, you dramatically reduce the distance that you need to get on this, on this overly simplified model by moving across that. And there's a number of ways that we can do that. We can go out and manually remove algae from the reef. And this is actually happening in Hawaii and another uh, part of Australia where this is, this is, I mean, they call it some silly name like the algae removal vacuum tool or something like that. It's a pool vacuum with a, with a big mesh bag where they're literally down there grabbing handfuls of it and just sucking it up into this dredge. Can you imagine picking all of the grass on a football field? 
and having it grow back faster than you can pick it. This is incredibly labor intensive and ineffective. We can also stop doing that, right? We're taking the critters off of the reef that are eating that stuff. That's like killing all of the, well, this would be like killing all of the cows in a field and expecting it to stay a, a savanna. It's not gonna happen. Um, we've also invested a, an enormous amount, so 41 or 42 years of effort in trying to put back out, these are diadema antelarum, the long spine sea urchin, the keystone herbivore in the, in the Caribbean species, and I'm still gonna spit that out every time. Uh, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. Um, we've invested more than 40 years trying to figure out how to get these back onto our reef in the numbers that they were back in the 70s, 60s, 50s. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why we probably don't want that many urchins on our reef. And one of them is that they bio erode the reef. So they actually eat the reef as well as the algae that they're, that they're after. Um, but this is a photo of them actually spawning. This is um, sperm from two individuals here. And, and our own Martin Moe from, I think he was on Tavernier, somewhere, somewhere up here in the Upper Keys. He, uh, yeah, Isla Murata. Yeah, he worked on this for 30 years and got really close. And he actually worked with uh, uh, Dr. Vaughn at, at Moat um, for a long period of time. And then just when he decided to retire, he handed it over to um, Dr. Josh Patterson and his grad student, now Dr. Aaron Pilnick at the University of Florida. And you can see that they, they were able to take the, the, they were able to stand on Martin Moe's shoulders and push diadema over that edge. Where now they are, uh, you can't really see that, but there's hundreds of cultured diadema here in these coolers getting ready to go back out onto the reef. Um, and you can see the little babies here at the Florida Aquarium up in Apollo Beach. Um, and Josh is a, is a, I mean, these, these guys are phenomenal and I love working with them. And they have really, they've really taken that, that massive foundation that Martin laid and they've, they've pushed it over the edge. So they're, they're now at the point where we can mass, well, we can probably mass produce diadema for restoration. They run into the same thing that we do where the critters that they produce are dumb. They're really dumb. They've never seen a, a, a predator ever, so they get they, you put them out on the reef and they eat a little bit of algae and get eaten immediately. Same thing we think we're gonna have with crabs, but we'll, that'll be like phase two. Um, but the reason, <laughs> we'll figure that out. Uh, the, the reason that I keep spitting out the word keystone is that if you have a disease like the one that killed off diadema and you have one species accounting for all of an ecological function, is that resilient? No. Diversity shares a very close relationship with resilience. As you have a higher richness of species or functions or, or critters doing a function on an ecosystem, the more resilient that, that function is. So think about your stock portfolio. If I put all of my money into Sears 10 years ago. It would have done, would have done really well up until about two years ago, right? Um, instead, you spread that out. You try to diversify that portfolio. You go for diversity in, in investments as well as in ecology. Um, so we're going to look at some other critters. You know, parrotfish, eh, you know, great. They're, they're fishy friends. You know, they're, they'll come up and smile at you and they eat urchins. So they're kind of, you know, they're, they're friendly enough. But um, now we're talking about something completely off the wall, crabs. And specifically this crab. And if you've, if you've dived around the Keys at night, or really anywhere in the Caribbean at night, you likely have come across this guy. It's the largest crab in the Western Atlantic. And we know it as the Caribbean king crab, but it is not a king crab, it is a spider crab. So I have to say that because the actual king crab people get really sensitive. So it's the Caribbean, yeah, it's the Caribbean not a king crab. Um, but it's also been known as the channel clinging crab and the West Indian spider crab. But those are not nearly as sexy as the Caribbean king crab. And so we're, we'll go with that. 
Um, it just just like it has many common names, it has many it has had many scientific names. So all the way back in 1818, it was it was described as Mithrax spinosissimus, which is a mouthful. But in 2014, uh, a friend of ours, Amanda Windsor, decided to make it more of a mouthful and call and reclassified it because it is so different than all of its cousins into its own genus, Damothrax spinosissimus. And dam, like I, I mean, you, you you'll have to you'll have to actually like look at the spelling. Like damn means means something in it actually means something in Latin. I don't remember what it is, but then Mithrax is actually a, 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 a nod to the, the parent genus. And then one year later, so all, <laughs> now all while you're writing your dissertation about this darn species, about this Damothrax species, um, you have to change the darn name in the whole document three times through, the, through this thing. But Klompmiker and, and uh, a bunch of others decided to re, 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 classify it as Magua Mithrax spinosissimus. And, and, you know, still seeing Mithrax, but Magua means nothing in Latin. It is a nod to the uh, family name of Toby Maguire. <laughs> this is an actual excerpt from the paper where they redid it because it is a spider crab. It is Spider-Man. Yeah. It's awful. Um, the largest crab in the Western Atlantic. So this is back when I was not quite half the man I am today. Um, but that was that was a very large animal. This is off of Belize, uh, right near Laughing Bird. Um, but what's interesting about this giant crab, and most crabs are, you don't think of vegetarians. You don't think of crabs as vegetarians. But these guys eat algae. And they eat a lot of algae, you know, I mean, and, and not to toot their horn, but we've, we've done a bunch of grazing assays over the years and, and we've had diadema and crabs and crabs kill them. They, they just, they just blow them out of the water with the amount of algae that they eat and the types. So it's not just the amount of algae that they eat. They eat the stuff that's chemically defended, that's calcified, that's really nasty and hard to get rid of and that other herbivores will avoid. So they are a very interesting and very, you know, potentially useful uh, herbivore on our reefs here in Florida, especially the ones that have been in that algal dominated stable state for a long time and have gone through successional stages in that algal community is really hard to get rid of. But there are not many of them, right? So the natural density of, of the Caribbean king crab on reefs here in the Florida Keys, this was done right, right there at Lower Matacumbe. Um, is one thousandth of a crab per square meter. Yeah, per square meter. Or, or one crab, roughly one or two crabs per kilometer squared. I mean, that's not, not enough. I mean, even if you had the biggest, most hungry cow in the world and you put it into a kilometer, you know, put it on a football field, it's not going to keep the grass under control. So my research early on was looking at what if we played with the density? What if we made a crab per meter square? So, so many, many more of them. Are we going to see them take care of that algae issue and allow for some other interesting effects and, and maybe move us along that horizontal axis on that graph? And so we did this right here in the middle keys. I think we're up here somewhere. I'm, I'm more familiar with there. Um, but this is right off. I don't know if anybody knows Habanos. On, on, yeah, uh, yeah. We used to go out to these these patch reefs right here and we'd do what we needed to do and then slink off to the bar for you know uh, one of those cuban uh wraps that they make and and then go back out and do the rest of our work um but these patch reefs each one of these dark areas is a is a chunk of reef and they're very similar to our offshore reefs just small and replicable and surrounded by sand so they're the perfect experimental units um, and they range in size from about the size of this lectern to about the size of the building that, well, probably more than the building that we're in. These are boats, just for, for size reference. They're perfect experimental units because you can apply different treatments to many of them and they're relatively spatially independent. 
So for this, this test of whether manipulating the density of these crabs, putting a bunch of the crabs in a place was going to have an effect on, on the reef health, we selected 12 of them. And on three of them, four of them, four of them, we did nothing. Kept them as controls. We were just going to watch them and then compare them to the ones that we put crabs on at one per square meter. And then others where we didn't know, I mean, if you look, this is all halomita. So it's that nasty calcified, chemically defended stuff that nothing eats except these guys. Um, we didn't know that they were going to be able to handle that. that. That algal canopy was about that deep. I mean, that's, a, that's an enormous amount of algae. So the third group of four, I went out and tried my hand at manually removing all of the algae from four large reefs. And, and I am not a fan of that. I, I <laughs> do not support doing that ever. It is horrible. It took weeks to do all this and, and many, many interns. Um, <laughs> but, so we had, we had three treatments. One, one where we were just, you know, our reference, our control. The next where we just put the crabs out and did nothing else. The next one where I went out there and mowed the lawn and then put the, the um, grasshoppers out there. And then we followed them through uh, a year. And every month I drove from Virginia Beach to here and took a series of, of one square meter photo quadrats. So photos of the bottom haphazardly or, or really kind of randomly across the surface to track changes in the in the cover of macroalgae. So how much of the surface was covered in algae through time? And this is kind of the, the um, summary of those data. So this is, well, and, and I hate saying percent cover. Everybody says that, but it's like saying meter length. It's cover of macroalgae <laughs> expressed as percent, right? So zero to 100%. And then across the bottom, obviously this graph didn't, this is, this is yeah, this is months, months through the year. Um, on the control reefs, algae cover, I mean, basically to, to kind of, uh, orient everybody, this is saying that 90% of the reef surface was covered in macroalgae. So these were incredibly degraded reefs and it stayed that way through the year. There's a little bit of, little bit of blip here and there, but that's, that's kind of seasonal stuff and, and just natural flux in the algal community just by putting crabs on the reef over the course of one year or scrubbing the reef and then putting crabs and obviously the labels didn't transfer either. 85% reduction in the cover of macroalgae. And when you're a graduate student, cause I was when I did this and you take these data, you're like super excited after a year and a half of work. Cause it took that long to go through all those photos and everything. And you go in and you're like, hey, check this out. And you see data that are that clean He's like, uh-uh, do it again. <laughs> They're like, oh, oh. So we, we moved up to Chica Rocks, just off of, a, off of Whale Harbor here, and did it again. And I won't go through the whole thing, but we added a treatment where we still had the control, we still had the adding crabs, still had the, the scrubbed and crabs, but I had to scrub even more reefs because we wanted to look at if you just scrub the reefs, do you get the same effect, you know, through time? Um, so not only did I have to do it again, I had to do it more. Um, and then, and then you look, this is uh, this is just a few years ago and this is pre-treatment and post-treatment. So this is the same time point just before and after the, I mean, so the only ones that are going to change are these, but just to orient you those, those, and then I, I put my foot down and we only did it quarterly. I didn't want to do that thousand mile drive 12 more times. Um, our control reefs started and stayed very high again, but not nearly as high. Just Chica Rocks is a, is a different system, um, but still very high, still 60, 70, 50, 60, 70%. That's still way beyond what you want a coral reef to be. Just by scrubbing the reef, immediately you affected almost a 90% reduction in the cover of algae. But then by the end of the experiment, it was no different than if you did nothing. So scrubbing reefs is, does not work in, in the Florida Keys when I do it. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and obviously these colors have changed too. This is just crabs. 
And again, this doesn't look as dramatic, but if you look at the numbers, this is 60% to 30%. So about a 50% reduction in the cover of macroalgae. And then by scrubbing the reef and putting out crabs, you have almost the same relationship. If you remove this wild, you know, superfluous line that didn't need to be tested um, out of the equation and you, and you compress this a little bit, the three lines are very similar to the last graph that we looked at. So fantastic. You go in and you tell your advisor another time and he says, nah, do it again. And you say, no, there's two <laughs> right there. No, not doing it again. So we're, we're fairly certain. We're very confident now. Uh, you know, this is, this is a few years ago. And since then, we've done this in Belize, Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, um, the Bahamas, a couple of other places, and it works. So we're really, really excited about this. But just removing macroalgae is, is interesting. But it's not that interesting. The cascading effects were the interesting part. So yes, we put the, we put the critters out there and they removed algae. But then almost immediately, you see this dramatic increase in, the, in not just the number of fish, but the number of fishes. And I'm, I don't know, does reef do the fish fishes thing? Like redfish, <laughs> redfish, blue fish, you know, one fish, two fishes. Um, so the mean abundance of fish, and this was the, this was the Habano trips where we would go out and place these cameras on bricks next to the, next to the reefs. And then we'd have to go away for, you know, a couple of hours to the bar and <laughs> wait for the cameras to do their thing without the diver bias and then come back and grab them. And this is pre-treatment and one year after the treatment was applied and you can, oh God, the colors are terrible. So I don't know if I don't know if these are translating on the camera, but there was a three to five fold increase in the number of fish on reefs that we scrubbed, added crabs to, or scrubbed and added crabs to. So anytime the algae cover went down, fish went up. And it was due to six families of fishes. Um, and and of note, one, two, three of them are herbivores. So not only by adding these herbivores onto the reef were we bringing in more fish, but they were herbivores themselves reinforcing that increase in grazing intensity. What's that? How did the, uh, the crabs survive over time because they weren't used to the predators and you said it's oh, I actually, I, I like hid those slides because, because we're like, we're like, we're only like halfway through the slide. Um, <laughs> but, but we, we went out there and we tested mortality and it was, it was very strongly related to size. So you have to put crabs out that are about this big. Uh, the body needs to be about the size, about the same size as the coral plugs that we use. Otherwise they all get eaten. And, and if you put them out this size or bigger, fewer of them get eaten. Um, and they have a better chance of, of affecting this. So that was all, that was all several years before, before all this work. But not only was the abundance of fish this three to five fold increase, so too was the richness of fishes, which is the number of species that you see. And there was a three to five fold increase in those on the reefs where algae was changed. And I'm very sorry about the unfortunate colors here. Um, so not only when you put crabs down, do you get more fish, you get more fishes. Um, and juvenile coral density. Now this is two years after the treatments were applied because coral responses are a little longer, a longer term. So we know that each of those reefs were close enough that they were getting the same kind of larval supply. The, the number of baby corals coming in was probably the same across all of them, but the survival of those baby corals was very different across the treatments. So the one where we scrubbed and removed the algae and it was episodically gone, still had double the number of juvenile corals living after two years. But the ones that we put crabs on or scrubbed and put crabs on had almost four times as many living juvenile corals. So not only do you get more fish and more fishes, you get more baby corals surviving. And this is two years later. Got them. Um, so exactly what I said, you add crabs to the reef, you reduce algae cover, you increase the richness of fishes and their abundance and the recruitment rate, not the settlement rate, the recruitment rate of corals. Cause these corals were, you know, two year olds, not, not little baby recruits that we can't find. 
Oh, sorry. These are left over. Oh, this is just kind of an, an, uh, a look at how some of these reefs looked. So this is a pre treatment and that's a post treatment. And you can see that the, the architectural complexity of that reef dramatically increased. So. Sometimes you have to ask about unintended consequences. Uh-huh. All that crab munching must produce a lot of crab poop. Yep. What is it? Does it have any detrimental effect or is it good? Well, it probably feeds a lot of sea cucumbers, but so, oh, sorry. So unintended consequences. And that's a question that we get all the time, you know, and, and this is a new one though. You know, all the, all that crab munching must produce a lot of crab poop. Are there any unintended consequences of all the crab feces on the reef? And, um, remember in, in the very beginning of the talk, I was talking about how ecologically complex and, and biologically productive but also efficient reefs are. So almost every trophic level, you know, the, the trophic pyramid where you have producers, consumers, predators, you know, so on and so on. Almost every level of that, that very simplified structure on a coral reef is coprophagous or they eat poop. So poop on a coral reef is like gold. You know, so other critters are eating it. And, you know, and, and obviously I answered that all that crab poop was probably feeding a lot of, of sea cucumbers, which then feed a lot of kind of in fauna and all that other kind of oh, stuff. So, well, I mean, I can, I mean, I don't desire it, but, you know, yes, it, it's not harmful in, in other words, but that's, but that's an interesting, it's an interesting question. And it's one that we're looking at very closely is, you know, maybe not, maybe not poop but that's that's a really that's that's the direction we're looking is you know how how does dramatically increase i mean by orders of magnitude the density of these crabs i would never do that no no i would never seed the crabs onto the reef from the boat like no that would be that would be wrong and you would definitely get in trouble for doing that i've never done that <laughs> Um, but yes, I mean, it, it's basically that kind of, that kind of density of crabs where, where we could literally go and just dump bags of crabs onto the reef and they'll situate themselves. And, and how does altering the, the, the ecological structure of that community so dramatically, how, how, you know, there's gotta be some other, some other kind of effect that we're not looking for. Like the the change in the fish community and and coral recruits we weren't expecting those results those were unexpected results yeah yeah or the cane toad and you know all those kinds of things we, but except that these are native species we're just altering their their relative abundance so we we have not yet found any unintended consequences however diadema when they were you know back in the 70s and 80s when they were super abundant that was not a natural abundance of those urchins. That was because all of those predatory fishes had been removed and competitors had been removed by overfishing for decades and centuries, which caused an explosion in their density. And the unintended consequence was that a pathogen was able to rip through that entire population throughout the entire region in less than a year. So there is the potential for that. However, we haven't run into those negative effects yet, but it's something that we're very, very, very carefully and very, very seriously considering. Um, we're going to breeze through the rest of them. That's just the same picture of a lot of fish on a reef. Um, so there's strong applications to using these crabs to facilitate coral reef rest, well, to facilitate coral restoration, making it kind of coral reef restoration, attacking the community rather than just the foundation species that, that support it. But we really need more crabs. So on that on that on both of those experiments that I that I just talked about, we only used about 500 crabs. So it's relatively low. No well, I mean that sounds like it sounds like a low number now. That's that was a heck of a lot of crabs. We had to go find them as a grad student. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, from other places. Yeah, no more questions. Um, so I'm sure I'm sure everybody is very familiar with uh, Mission Iconic Reefs. Is, a, is an initiative by, led by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary to demonstrate high intensity, high, high uh, um, yeah, intensity restoration at seven iconic reef ecosystems throughout the Florida Keys. Um, 
notice that I've already worked at one of them. Um, but Caribbean king crabs and diadema are a very big part of this plan to restore those seven iconic reefs. And when they built this plan for Mission Iconic Reefs, they, they did kind of a back of the envelope calculation and estimated that they would need roughly 28,000 crabs, which sounds a heck of a lot more than 500. But then I kind of went back behind them and looked at the math and everything, and they were only putting crabs here and here. They were not putting them on anything other than, or no, and here, and here. Um, they weren't putting them anywhere that wasn't a patch reef ecosystem. So we recalculated because they can go into contiguous reef habitat. We just use patch reefs because they're convenient for experimental purposes. And, oh, oh, we got rid of it. Darn it. All right. So this is supposed to animate to the actual number that you would need to do this is 2.8 million crabs. Twice. Twice every 10 years, we think. So about 5.6 million crabs. But we're not just working on the third largest barrier reef ecosystem on, on the planet. We're also working on the second largest barrier reef ecosystem on the planet, the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef. We did a back of the envelope calculation of, of restorable reef area across the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef and calculated one crab per meter square. And it comes up to about 96 million crabs. How do we produce more than 500 crabs over four years? Um, <laughs> sex. So it turns out that not only are these crabs phenomenal herbivores and really, really wonderful to work with in restoration, they're also like, they're like cheating in terms of aquaculture. They go, you know, for example, everybody's familiar with our spiny lobster, which goes from hatching as an egg to a post larva that swims in from the Gulf Stream, that process goes through 23 different larval stages and takes nine months. Then it takes two years to get to an adult. These guys go through three, well, three, most of the time, sometimes four larval stages in four to six days. And then they go from a juvenile crab to an adult. We've had it happen in 10 months. So aquaculture, they're like the, they're, they're they're eating algae, but they don't. You don't even have to feed them in these stages because they don't have working mouth parts. So they're like the easiest aquaculture species on the planet. You don't have to feed them. You can you can aquaculture the heck out of them in a bucket, and they and they just grow like weeds, and they eat algae. Um, and so we've we've set up a small lab to do that down at IC two R three in Summerlin Key. And in this tiny little set of raceways here and a couple of tanks over there, we were producing roughly 10,000 juvenile crabs every couple of months. And rapidly getting them to the size that we wanted to put them out. It was taking about three to five months to get a crab that was the size that we needed to put them out onto the reef for restoration. And it was so successful that I convinced our CEO to let me use an old sturgeon aquaculture facility so each of these buildings was an old sturgeon production facility for uh, caviar uh, up until about 2015. Um, each building is the size of a football field. I convinced him to give me about half of it to build a large aquaculture system designed to hold three, 300 to 400 adult brood stock, produce, you know, hold about 48 brooding females at a time, so 48 clutches of eggs. 96 clutches of juveniles in, in raceways and produce roughly 250,000 juvenile crabs a year. And that means that we could get to 2.8 million crabs roughly in about 10 years. And he bought, he, he, he bought it. He let me, he let me do it. Um, I got, I got some money to, to do this and he, and he kicked in a bunch of moat funds to, to do it. We, we took apart the old and these are soup. These are so cool. These are old sturgeon tanks. You know, I mean, big like dinosaur sturgeon kind of things. This is 25 feet by 25 feet by five feet deep. And we captured three of them and dug one of them out for some reason. Um, but this is that facility actually during the thermal stress event. We had thermally stressed corals in these tanks over here. These are all crab tanks. And you can see back here the, the, tanks for, for hatching out the juveniles. 
Um, and the tanks are so big that my staff actually has to get in them to go and inventory the crabs and check for eggs and so on and so on. And then we started producing larvae and eggs. Each of these little, little smudges here is actually a swimming larva in the water. Each of these little dots is a larva on the bottom and she's not done hatching. Um, and we've already, we, we commissioned this facility. We cut the ribbon on this facility in September. And we're already, we've got juveniles that are just about ready to go back out. But we just talked about putting all of our eggs into one basket, right? Shifting from urchins to crabs would not convey any resilience on grazing function. So, and I'll, and I'll speed through these because we're right at the end. And I'm sorry, I'm like way over, aren't I? Um, the Mithracidae, the family of crabs that Magwamithrax spinosismus belongs to, is actually 39, 39 species of Mithracids, and almost all of them are herbivorous, or well, omnivorous with algae making up a big part of their diet. Um, this one, the emerald crab, is, is, a, is a big mainstay of the uh, um, ornamental aquarium trade. And it's a native species out here, and it's actually a decent herbivore. And the other one that we're working with doesn't isn't on here, but there's there's so many of them that there's no reason that we shouldn't be looking at all kinds of different species to to attack these functions. Um, and just like Darwin's finches, you know, they're all eating seeds, but the ones with the big beak are eating the big you know Brazil nuts, and the ones with the little little beaks are eating the little tiny seeds and everything. These guys are eating different types and, and amounts of different types of algae. So putting them all together, you get a much more resilient and, and effective ecological function in grazing. And some of the projects that we're moving along in, and I'm sorry, I'll, I'll pound through these. The eh. <laughs> <laughs> eh. um, some of these guys, and these guys look really big, but they're actually that big as adults. Um, and this is Mithraculus carifae and Mithraculus cinctimanus, and both are really important or really common um, Mithracids that occur throughout the region on shallow reefs and are almost entirely dependent on branching corals. But in most of the Caribbean, this branching species has disappeared, so you find them in these seagrass beds with parites thickets. You know, so the little branching corals on those really shallow seagrass beds, you find a bunch of these guys but in Belize and a couple of other places where you go and you find these new co isolated colonies of staghorn coral and the ones that do have crabs have no algae around them, this grazing halo and no, no damage from damselfish and things. The ones that don't have those crabs hanging out in the branches do have all of those things. So we're looking at can we use the big crabs to handle big architecturally complex areas that are covered with algae, we'll take care of that. But then in the, in the places where we're out planting staghorn, it's relatively featureless and flat. Not great for the big crabs that need crevice shelters and things like that. But if we outplant the little ones with the coral, can they basically weed our coral garden for us as it grows? And once that structure is there and the thicket forms, then the big crabs can move in and help, help with everything. Another one is optimizing the herbivore assemblages for restocking to enhance coral recruitment. You know, so basically using these three species of herbivores, can we enhance the settlement and metamorphosis of coral larvae? So different combinations of critters are gonna produce a different algal assemblage. You take, you take a, an algae field and you put different herbivores in it, They're, the resulting algal assemblage is gonna be different. And we're looking at how coral larvae prefer or don't prefer those different resulting algal assemblages to kind of perimeterize a model to look at, you know, in a, in a place where you have this kind of algal assemblage, you need these two, or you need all three, or you just need these guys to basically build a model that tells us how to address algae to facilitate coral recruitment. Um, we also looked at a bunch, so this is again from, from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, funded this study where we looked at another suite of herbivores, snails, and how those snails or different combinations of different species of snail affected the algal community. And this must have been early in the experiment. 
But you can see that the algal community on these tiles is very different. Each of these little dots is a coral. Um, and then finally, how does, is, any, is every, everyone familiar with the spotted spiny lobster? Yeah. So not the Caribbean spiny lobster that's the big fishery. It's like nasty gangland cousin that lives on the reef and <laughs> comes out at night to, yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're awful. I mean, they're beautiful, but just like coral reefs, they're gorgeous, but bad, bad character right here. They are, they are one of the, one of the most voracious predators on the reef. Um, I've literally seen them at night. They, they're nocturnal. They come out at night and they'll come out and I've seen them grab fish out of the water column and kill them and eat them. I mean, they're, they're crazy predators, but their pee, you know, so lobsters have this really, really cool trait where they, they communicate by peeing on each other. Um, and the, and the olfactory signals in their urine are ways that they communicate, but also how other critters can sense them. Um, and the urine from this guy causes diadema to stop grazing and run. So it's called a, it's called a negative indirect effect or a non-consumptive effect where just the presence of this guy is enough to turn this into not an effective herbivore. And that's been published. This study is looking at whether that's limited to diadema and, and Panularis guttatus, or if it covers all invertebrate herbivores. And, and it looks, I mean, the preliminary data are looking like, yeah, yeah, the urine from that guy terrifies all of these guys and causes them to stop eating algae and run for cover. Which presents a management issue because these are also the likely or a likely predator of the snail that's eating all of our darn coral. There's a coral liver snail out there that is just decimating some of those restored coral populations. And this is probably one of its only predators out there. So do you remove the, do you remove the spotted spiny lobsters to facilitate grazing and just sacrifice the coral to the snails? Or do you leave them to eat the snails and just, you can't do anything about the algae. So it's this very interesting ecological system. Good luck. Yeah. The, yeah. It, so the question was, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the point here is that, that all of these different pieces of the puzzle all fit into this incredibly complex ecological and trophic uh, structure that is a coral reef. There's so many different interactions across so many different species. And we're just talking about a few of the invertebrates. We're not even talking about microbes or algae or anything. So, so the, the point is that this is an incredibly complex ecosystem and, and this is just one little piece of that really interesting puzzle. Um, but restoration is a team sport and this is kind of the, the like cheeky part of the talk um, where we need you to get involved. And how can you get involved? Go out and dive with Reef with eye care, with Scuba Pro, with all of these different institutions that allow you to get out there and get hands-on. It's, it's, it, education, hands-on in particular, is probably the best way to communicate the science and the reason for it. Um, so if you haven't seen, oh, there are notes on this one. I didn't make these slides, they look nice. Um, <laughs> but there are, there are quite a bit of, uh, of opportunities, especially here in the Keys and with Moat and with uh, Eye Care and with Reef and with CRF and with all, all these different groups to get out there and get your hands and eyes on the reef and see firsthand what's going on and then participate in that team sport that is restoring function to those ecosystems. Um, you can also volunteer and, and thank you to all of you that do. Um, visit. Come visit some of the, the coral nurseries. See how this process is done, microfragmentation in particular. And, and actually, Katie can talk to you about getting involved in actually cutting up corals at, at the nurseries up here in the Upper Keys or down there at, at, uh, at the nursery in Summerlin. Um, Hands-on experiences. This is, I mean, this is literally what I was just talking about. You can go see Lucas and Katie at uh, our Key Largo nursery and actually microfragment corals and contribute to producing the corals that we're using for this uh, incredibly important work. Um, you can go get this sweet uh, license plate. And for every one of these license plates that you, uh, that you put onto your car, like mine, well, not, not yet, but 
It's, <laughs> on the other car, it's on there. Um, it's a $25 donation goes directly to Moat. And about half of that money every year is, is put up for, for bids. I mean, it's basically put out as a request for proposals to fund other research by partnering institutions and, and so on. So Protect Our Reefs uh, funded several of the studies or fund, is funding several of the studies that I just talked about um, and has funded uh, with uh, something like $9 million over the last couple of years. Um, it supports modes research, but it also supports a, a, an enormous number of scientists throughout the U.S. Um, and then you can donate to to moat to to all all kinds of different um, institutions that are working on this. Um, and then the acknowledgments. Got to say thank you to all of the people that did give us money. So the National Marine Sanctuaries Foundation is is the leading is kind of leading the charge with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and Mission Iconic Reefs. And they have funded a large amount of the crab work and the coral work that we're doing. Um, FWC, DEP, FWC and NOAA also, like all of, the, all of the work presented here was permitted by the Florida Fish and Wildlife. <laughs> so we have permits from our, our management partners here. Um, but there's, there's a whole group of other, other institutions and, um, and groups that have contributed funding. Uh, both in-kind support and, and actual financial support for the work that we just talked about and, and ongoing work, um, and a number of different institutions that we, that we partner with uh, around the entire region. Um, and I will shut up. So thank you very much. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> So many friends of the fish, like literally fish and friends or like all of the who knew. Um, thank you so much. We are over time. We usually try to end this up by eight o'clock, but I'm sure that there are questions. So uh, I think what I'll probably do is say thank you to you. And if you don't mind sticking around for a little sure. bit, if people have questions, they want to come up. I want to thank the rest of our reef staff, um, our interns who help make everything go well here. <laughs> here on the front row, our marine conservation um, fellows as well, up here in the front row. Moose Mussie's our um, education and outreach leader. She's right here in case you haven't met her. Mead back here is our one of our new staff. You met him last time and Sierra's back there as well, as well as Lex. So if you haven't already said hello to us as reef staff, please do and um, support all that mo I mean we're really we're in this community together yeah. doing this work together and it all it all connects to each other. So we thank you to everyone who's online and all of you for coming here.